James Weissman, the nation's number one high school basketball recruit, has been suspended. Chase Young, college football's best defensive player, has been suspended. I don't know if there's any more catching headline for an article or a video out there right now, but before we all go charging off to Twitter to argue and yell at the NCAA, let's take a look at these situations. Because while they're similar in many ways, there are key differences and the situations are more complex than they seem to be on the outside. So let's take a look at two of the biggest and most talented young athletes on the planet and how they may very well be the bellwether of the changes the NCAA seem to be making. Let's start with James Weissman. His situation is the freshest in our minds right now. He was suspended indefinitely by the NCAA after it was reported that he received money from his coach, Penny Hardaway, to help him move to Memphis a couple years ago. Reportedly, the NCAA has been investigating this situation since the summer. Penny Hardaway allegedly helped pay for Wiseman and his family to move to Memphis before Wiseman began school. A court issued an injunction, so Wiseman will actually be able to play this Friday, today, the day of recording. We're gonna actually get back to that. Suffice it to say, Wiseman's season could be over if this suspension is upheld. So now let's move on to the Chase Young situation. He was also suspended indefinitely, although people seem to think that there's a better chance he could get reinstated than what's come out so far about Weissman. He received a loan from a family friend a couple years ago. Reportedly, he's paid the loan back, quote, months ago. So let's start with how they're different. We'll get, we'll get to the similarities in a second, but the differences are actually important here. Chase Young's payment was a loan from a family friend, which he paid back months before he entered into the Heisman discussion. The loan was before he even started at Ohio State, and it was reportedly to help pay for living expenses and things like that. Whereas Weissman's payment was not a loan, and it came from the guy who would eventually become his coach. Weissman's payment was before he had even committed to Memphis, as I understand it. And of course, James Weissman's situation is now in court, where Chase Young, as I understand it, is still being deliberated by the NCAA itself. But let's get now to the similarities real quick, and then I will try to explain how these two situations are actually bigger, specifically Weissman, is actually bigger than, than just the details here. Both of these cases involved family friends. So something I didn't mention is that Penny Hardaway coached James Weissman in AAU ball and then in high school before Hardaway got hired to coach Memphis, which was reportedly after he had paid Weissman to move to the Memphis area. Weissman then later committed to Memphis with Hardaway as the coach. It was reported then that a big piece of it was the fact that Weissman had a lot of familiarity with Penny Hardaway. And also, both moves involved a central issue, the issue that I want to focus on for now. Did these athletes receive benefits that would not be available for other students? In the case of Chase Young, it seems pretty clear, at least with everything we know about the situation. And that's the caveat I wanna add. There's obviously so much that can come out about both of these situations. And so this is, if something else does come out that would render anything that I'm saying invalid, then so be it. But I'm talking about just about what we know right now. No, no, Chase Young didn't receive any kind of benefit that wouldn't be available to a non-athlete college student. I'm sure you know plenty of people or you have yourself gotten loans from family or close friends. It's pretty standard practice. The Weissman situation, on the other hand, is much further into the gray area. It seems clear Hardaway was at least close to Weissman himself and probably the entire Weissman family. So Hardaway was providing the same service in theory that Chase Young's family friend was. But the optics of a guy coaching the nation's top recruit for years before accepting a job at a school that has had success in basketball but has fallen on some hard times and then bringing that same guy with him and paying for him to move to where the school is, is not great. Now, Hardaway is from Memphis. He coached a Memphis area grassroots team and then a Memphis area high school. 
So it's not like his hire came out of absolutely nowhere, especially given his previous success at the NBA level, but at the very least, it's a conflict of interest, and at worst, it's a deliberate attempt to buy a top young recruit. But then, that gets us into the real reason I wanted to talk about this. The stuff about whether these guys received benefits that another student wouldn't get is fun, but it seems that particular issue is going to be invalidated by a bigger problem. Now, I'm not a fan of Memphis or Ohio State, and I probably wasn't going to watch a ton of Memphis basketball or Ohio State football until the postseason anyway. So this situation doesn't affect me very much when it comes to these two athletes. But I believe the implications here are much bigger than just these two guys. And I'm talking specifically about the California Fair Pay to Play Act and the subsequent NCAA ruling that allows college athletes to profit off of their names and likenesses. If you're curious about the full implications of that bill, I made a video about that, which is in that I card in the corner. And in that video, I talked about the potential implications of allowing athletes to profit off of themselves. But one thing I didn't talk about very much is how we actually define name, image, and likeness, and also how we define profit. In this particular situation, specifically when it comes to Wiseman, would a coach helping a young high school recruit move to the state their school is in qualify under that standard? Let's say for the sake of argument, Hardaway didn't know Wiseman personally and had just heard of him. He would have scouted Wiseman, sat down and talked to him, and brought him in to visit campus. If he then cuts a check for $1,000 to help Weissman move to Memphis, would that not be profiting off of your name? Now, maybe there's something I'm missing. I'm absolutely sprinting to get this video out. Or maybe there's something in the California bill or the proposed NCAA regulation I missed. But this seems to me like it would be a pretty obvious use of the name, image, and likeness standard. In the US legal system, anytime there's a standard that needs defining, the courts and the judges are the ones that do it. And so when I mention that we'll come back to the courts issuing a temporary injunction on James Weissman's suspension, we're already seeing courts get involved in this, what we'll call post-fair play to act world. This certainly will not be the last time this happens either. Maybe in the future I'll do a video examining how the courts might rule on the specifics of the fair pay to play act that's far too complex of an issue to get into right now. By the way, let me know if that's something you want. Uh, let me know on Twitter, at Griff from GA, or in the comments. The point here, though, is with the courts getting involved, this issue has gone from a conversation tossed away by the NCAA to getting ruled on in court in a matter of months. And when it comes to Weissman specifically, the question is almost as much an ethical one as it is one about the legal precedence of the Fair Pay to Play Act. Even though that's not the issue directly at the heart of the Weissman case, it's certainly easy to see how an issue exactly like this could be used to set precedence on the Fair Pay to Play Act and any other law or NCAA rule like it. And when I say it's an ethical question, I mean it. Let me take that example that I talked about before, if Hardaway did not know Weissman personally. If Hardaway uses his influence to either pay Weissman himself or get someone to pay Weissman to come to school, in some ways, to me, that seems like it's kind of ruining the entire purpose of college sports. I thought the NCAA, for so many years, held out from a rule that would allow athletes to profit off of themselves because they didn't want this exact thing happening. And by using that name, image, and likeness standard and not just saying athletes can be paid outright, it seems to me that the NCAA was trying to avoid this particular thing where people can pay recruits. And that seems to be, in that particular example, if a coach gives a guy money to help him move, and you know, maybe a little kickback, maybe the guy only needs a thousand bucks to move, the coach says, well, you know, here's 5,000. Here's your first couple months of rent when you get here, or here's an extra 15,000, buy yourself a car, or something like that. Now, to me, this seems to me like it, that is still covered under the profiting off of your name, image, and likeness, because you're putting your name out there and the coaches are paying for your services. The more I talk about this, the more I feel like that is that would blatantly go against what the NCAA is actually trying to do here. What they, I think, had in mind was something like, we want athletes to be in video games, not that we want athletes to be paid directly for being athletes, 
But wouldn't it be pretty easy for a coach to say, well, I look, I was paying this athlete because we want him to be on the cover of our class program or something like that. There, there's unless there's a standard in there, there's no defining number. There's there's nothing to stop a coach from saying, yeah, we paid a hundred grand for this kid to be in one TV ad. Yeah, it's obviously overpaying, but there's no rule against it. But that would to me seem very convenient because then the athlete has has an incentive to go to certain schools because they're paying him more, and then they're just hiding it under that name, image, and likeness standard. So unless the NCAA comes up with specific rules to prevent that from happening, the courts are going to have to rule on this over and over and over again. And it'll probably end up in the Supreme Court in all likelihood if it becomes a battle like that. Because here's the thing, athletes will be able to get a union or at least some kind of players association like we see in the NFL or in any major professional sport for that matter. And if they do that, of course, that association is going to be pulling for the athletes to get more and more and more money for broader and broader and broader cases. And of course, the NCAA will be pushing back against that. And so this, to me, seems like it's a situation that eventually will end up in the Supreme Court. But then for all of us, we have to ask ourselves, is that what we want from college sports? Is that the world that we want? in college sports. Is it really even college sports anymore? And I'm not talking about the the more the morality or the ethics of paying athletes on the base level. I think we should be paying athletes. And to me, giving an athlete a kickback for start for, you know, being on the cover of an NCAA video game or giving an athlete you know, giving a swimmer uh, a little stipend to teach a swimming course and advertising that. That's what I want to see because athletes have earned that. But in a situation like this, I think it becomes much more complicated. So maybe the Weissman and Young situations won't get that big. Maybe they're more black and white than I believe them to be right now. Maybe I've missed something in the Fair Pay to Play Act that specifically outlaws players profiting when it comes to recruiting. But the way I look at it right now, this could be the first domino to fall in what will surely be a long, ugly battle to flesh out these new rules in what appears to be a completely new era of college sports. And maybe from situations like this, we can see that all of these issues are more gray than maybe they seem to be on the outside. And we owe it to the athletes of the future to try to eliminate all the issues we can as thoroughly as we can. We appreciate you watching GA Sports.